Buenos días a todos. Buenos días a todos. Saben que tengo una voz potente. Utilizaremos el, el micrófono para Cristina y etcétera, etcétera. Eh, bienvenidos al curso en nombre de los organizadores, el profesor Luis Mañana, la doctora María González, y lo mismo. Eh, es una satisfacción tener, haber podido en este curso de los cursos de verano y tener nada menos que casi 40 personas dentro del curso. He de deciros que es, creo que, el único curso de ciencias que tiene dos aulas, lo cual la verdad es que nos da una enorme satisfacción. Bueno, eh, el curso está dedicado a la fusión nuclear, pero fijaros que no es la fusión nuclear de te, la visión de ir explicando los principios de la fusión nuclear. Eso creo que os quedó claro, claro a todos desde el primer momento. Nuestro objetivo es que entendáis al final del curso cuáles son los retos que la propia fusión nuclear tiene a la hora de plantearse ser realmente una fuente de generación de energía eléctrica en el futuro tanto desde la vía con magnética como la vía inercial. Por lo tanto, quiero con esto advertiros, indicaros, que tenéis que ser capaces de captar, quizás no todo, quizás no todo, pero sí la esencia de los desarrollos que os van a explicar, que contribuyen en las distintas partes, tanto de la fusión magnética como de la fusión inercial. Y algunas de las partes que os van a resultar algo más duras que otras, en concreto posiblemente lo de esta mañana, tiene como objetivo el tener la oportunidad de que un grupo o algunos grupos os presenten cosas por primera vez públicamente. ¿Eh? Si es que vais a ser recipiendarios de, de investigaciones que se van a empezar a desarrollar a partir de ahora. Tratar de captar el concepto. No os perdáis en lo que pueda llegar a ser una alta formulación. Primera cosa. Segundo, quiero dar muy especialmente las gracias a todos los speakers, de manera muy, muy especial, a quien me va a, continu va a continuar en mi, con, después de estas primeras palabras, que es a mi querido amigo Carlos Alejandre, director general del CIEMAD, que ha tenido, tenemos el honor, por una parte, y ha tenido... En fin, como es él, la, la buena disposición para venir aquí al Escorial con tantas cosas como hoy en concreto hay en el Gobierno de España eh, eh, para, para, para explicaros su fusión nuclear, ciencia o mito. Y hay otra novedad, lamentable, pero que viene a consecuencia de los acontecimientos que ocurrieron el sábado, que es que la presencia de la Secretaria General de Innovación la doctora Teresa Riesgo, no se va a producir. Y no se va a producir porque el cambio de gobierno con la salida del ministro Duque y la entrada de una nueva ministra, pues supone que hoy tiene que estar, lógicamente, al pie del cañón en el ministerio, con la nueva toma de posesión y, en fin, en una situación eh, pues inestable, por decirlo de alguna manera, ¿no? como los plasmas inestables. Exactamente igual. Nada más. Cosas eh, muy rápidas. Una que seguro que queréis todos saber. El wifi. Sí hay wifi. No tenéis nada más que entrar en una, un puntero, que hay cursos de verano y automáticamente os entra el wifi. ¿Eh? Y por mi parte, nada más que disfrutéis el curso. Nos tenéis a vuestra disposición para lo que sea. Quiero eh, también, in English now, Thanks very much to our colleague in English, Dr. Tobin, Dr. De Bonnell, Dr. Galloway, Dr. Landy, Dr. Batani, who is there um, to have the possibility to share with them the different research. And thank you, thank you very much for uh, giving the honor to this course. No more. My dear secretary, you want something? No? Bueno, entonces damos pie otra cosa. The last thing. Because we have in the room English speakers and English speaking and 
as you probably know, we have 50 streaming licenses. At least half of them are in English. We will give the <coughs> classes in English. You have some problem? Officially, need to be in Spanish. But because this circumstance, we want to give the classes in English. I don't think uh, you have any problem for that. So we will start with uh, Dr. Carlos Alejandre, Director General of the MAT, with the presentation of nuclear fusion. What is nuclear fusion? A science of, of a myth. Science of fiction. Oh, I think uh, I have my. You can hear me, and it's mm, through the microphone. Okay. So, um, thank you very much for this invitation. For me, it's really a pleasure. And as Manolo was saying, and I particularly thank to all the organizers for this invitation. As uh, Manolo was saying, for me, it's kind of um, very difficult to say no to an invitation to speak about fusion, to speak about uh, energy, about, uh, about um, how we can we should, this big problem that we have in, in energy in the world, how this could have a, an influence in, in, in our work in, in nuclear fusion. Oh, yes, this is, thank you very much. Now you can identify me. And it would be <coughs> a little bit easier for me also. Um, this is um, also gives me a, this big issue that um, happen, is happening right now in our country uh, is also a very good opportunity. You know, I have a talk of about 20 minutes now. I'm afraid that you will have to withstand me for maybe half an hour, one hour. You know, I start work talking and, and you never know when, when I will finish. But uh, this is, this is uh, mm, I thought that the, as the title of this, of this talk to, to, to say what we are going to talk about nuclear fusion. Is this science or is fiction? Because one of the problems that uh, anybody working in fusion has to uh, realize or we have to withstand also uh, is that the, this joke about the um, uh, time conservation of the time that we are going to, when we are going to have fusion. As, uh, is the, the energy of the future and it will always be. Is, this is also a joke that uh, we have to suffer. I hope to convince you today that uh, nuclear fusion, it is fiction, but really it's a reality. It's a reality that is working right now. But why, why we are working on fusion? You will hear in this course um, many, many um, experiments, many projects, all of them huge, well, many of them which are huge. We'll talk about ITER in, in just a moment. <coughs> we are talking about a project which is 30 billion euros, maybe, maybe more, something like that. And why are we spending that big amount of public money, which at the end is public money, on, on, this, on these issues if as they say, is the energy of the future and it will always be. We, I, I hope to convince you that we must have this, this work and, and do. Also, I hope to convince the, the new minister that they have to invest in this, in this you know. And the old one, it was already convinced. Now let's hope with the, with the new one. Okay, uh, let's talk about the energy consumption. Th see, this is more or less a picture of the per capita consumption in the world in the 90s, 1990. I'm not talking about now. And you, as you can see, uh, we have countries like Canada, which is always a surprise. We always think that the United States is the biggest uh, energy consumption. It's not, it's Canada. Remember how cold it is in Canada. And it, it, as you see, you have a big impact, I mean, a, a huge uh, kilowatt hour per capita expenditure in, in in Canada, also in United States, in, in all the developed countries. And you can see also here um, that the, if you think how much uh, expenditure it is in a, in a, um, of a lamp 
of 100 watts, you see it's relatively small. And you see that there are countries like Brazil, China, India in the 90s, which were more or less even less per capita expenditure than a, a light bulb. This is uh, something to, as you will see, something to worry us. And one of the reasons why we have um, um, to spend a lot of uh, money on, on these issues. Let's make a kind of a back of the envelope uh, calculation. What was the, the world average at that time in the, of, in the 90s? About 2,000 kilowatt hour per person per year. And uh, so it's very easy to know the consumption. We were more or less five, million, five billion uh, people in, in, um, in the world. 2,000, we have 10 to the 4 terawatt um, hour um, energy consumption. Now let's, let's make a planification. Let's, let's say, okay, let's plan, let's foresee what is going to happen in the future. We assume that the population doubles in the middle of this century. Is this the case? Well, right now, last time I look uh, this morning, I think we were more than almost 8 billion people. So it's, we are not that far from that point of view. And now let's think that we, there is a progress. You know that since the 90s, there is a lot of progress in the, in the world and life is uh, much better in many places. So let's assume that less of one third of the American consumption allows a very good quality of life. This is kind of a, an assumption. What happens then? So what happens if you make the, this very simple calculation, you go from five to 10, you go from two to three, to, from 2,000 to 3,000 kilowatt hour, and you get that the, uh, you need three times what the consumption was in the 90s. More or less at the middle of this century, you will need more or less three. Maybe it's not uh, three, maybe it is two and a half. The truth is that we are more or less already at the level of the three, and we are still not in the middle of the, of the century. So, and, and you, you say, of course, a very simple uh, way is that, okay, so this is too much, so let's, let's stop. Uh, let's try to be conservative, uh, try to look for a very efficient way to use uh, your energy in such a way that you don't need to go to these huge numbers. But can you do that? This is, this is the reality. See, this is a, a very nice, I like very much this, uh, this graph where what you have, as you can see here, you have the hum what is called the Human Development Index. This is given by the United Nations. It's an index that gives you kind of a measure of the quality of life of a place. Uh, it uh, includes uh, the what is the expenditure in education, expenditure in, in, in health, uh, what is the PIB, the, uh, the product, the, the GMB, of a particular country, and they combine this in a nice, in a nice index that goes between zero and one. And in the other, in the axis, you see that this is there is a very good correlation with the annual per capita electricity use. And this is kind of interesting. You see that if you are beyond 4,000 per capita kilowatt hour per capita in the world, more or less you are in a in a situation where it's very difficult to differentiate the standard, this human index, to go beyond 0.9. You see all, all the big countries, all the, the developed countries, that th there is not a big difference between them. But once to get, you have to get to this 4,000. But if you are below this, this expenditure in, in energy in your country, remember that you need energy to produce food, you need the energy to move, you need energy to light, you need energy not for very sophisticated things, just to live. You need to spend um, in energy in your daily life. And as you can see, big countries, India, China, where were they in the, in the 90s? Very low in this, in this picture of the, of the energy consumption, as we saw, and very low in the Human Development Index. And what do they want the people in these countries? They want to live better, which is a very reasonable um, thing to, to think and to wish uh, for, for the people in these countries. So 
It means that if they are going to live better, they are going to spend more energy. They need to spend more, they need to consume the consumption of much more energy. And therefore, it's very, very difficult that we can go beyond, we cannot go beyond this uh, time of three of the world energy consumption. And where are we getting this energy? Well, in the 90s, this, this is again a very interesting um, numbers. Uh, I'm getting this from a, a web where you can, the BP, the British Petroleum Energy Outlook, which have a very good, um, a very good data there. Say, uh, in the 90s, I, I was giving this talk, this part of this talk for many years. Actually, I, I started to give it in the 90s. Um, and, and when I came back to fusion, to more general things, uh, a few years ago, I was asked to give a talk about, um, about this energy and fusion and so on. And I said, OK, so I'm going to take my old data and see what is the situation now. And that was the surprise. Because you know, if you look the numbers which are not inside the parentheses, the one, the 43, 22, 20, and so on, you see that uh, the consumption coming from fossil fuels was, in the 90s, was 85% of all energy production. We all heard about and we all saw, I mean, windmills, we saw a lot of uh, photovoltaic and so on. So I thought, OK, it will not be 85%. It will, of course, it's not. It was 86%. See, this is the reality. This is, this is what is happening right now. Consumption of fossil fuels continues to be huge, huge. And it's not going down. Whatever you hear, I th think that I'm talking world energy consumption. I'm not talking about this particular country, which is going down, or this uh, other country. But globally, we continue to burn fossil fuels in a massive way. And we know the consequences of that. Uh, we need, uh, we, you know, uh, when you think of the, all the um, um, environmental consequences of burning fossil fuels right now, it's going to be um, a, a big issue for, for all of us and for the generations to come. So we have to, to look for some other options instead of using these uh, fossil fuels. So what are the options that we have? We don't have that many. That's the problem, that we do not have that many options. We can continue to burn fossil fuels. And we can mm, continue to produce CO2 and, and all the gases, all the, the greenhouse uh, gases in a massive way. Or, of course, we can go to renewables to seek breakthroughs, breakthroughs in production and very important in storage. Because otherwise, you know, day and, day and, day and night is something that we cannot avoid. Uh, to have uh, days like we had yesterday here in Spain, for example. What happened yesterday in Spain? Huge. It was very hot. There was uh, any wind. It was not during most of the time. The wind in these last days, we are having an anticyclone. And you know, we are not producing any wind. So the energy, the price of the energy is going up. Of course, it's going up because we are using gas. Gas is very expensive for, because of the CO2 and so on. So this is, this is the reality that we have right now. Uh, we can have nuclear fission, of course, nuclear power plant. But you know, people don't like it. You know, this is very, very terrible, you know, to have uh, nuclear fission. Is it? Uh, I don't know. If, if you want to reduce CO2, you have to look for what are the tools to do it. You cannot refuse because the problem that we have as a human as a humanity, it's, it's really huge. And of course, what you can do is to, to have fusion, uh, to demonstrate that this is possible, that we, it is feasible, and it is uh, something that we, can, that we can do. And this will be the, to see the objective of this, uh, of this course, to, to show you what are the challenges in order to do that. Because if we do not do that, we have a big problem. 
uh, look at this, uh, of this um, graph where you have the levels of uh, CO2 in the last 400,000 years. This is very simple to, uh, to obtain. You go to the Antarctic, you make a hole, you start going down, and as you go down, you go, uh, you go back in time because you, the air is really, mm, you can see the samples of the air that uh, happen in your samples in there, and you can see the, the evolution of the CO2, which is more or less constant related to, to, to where the position of the, of the Earth is, is in particular, and what is the, the spinning, how, and so on, and the, we have a, 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 normal, a normal evolution. But as you can see in the last years, this is going exponentially going up because of the, of the production of CO2 that we have in, in the world. And the, the implications are very clear, and we all know that. I mean, yesterday the, we had the, uh, this peak of um, uh, heat in, in, in Spain, where all the, the numbers were, were to record values. But uh, even if it is uh, questionable that one particular event is related to these uh, changes in, in the climate due to the CO2 effects, uh, it is true that the, when you have an accumulation of these events, then it's clear a pattern that is changing. And we know that we have looked at uh, many of the, of the ice formation in the mountains, in some mountains, taken in a few year difference, and you, you can see that the amount of ice that we have, the heating that is happening, it is happening there. And when I mentioned the, the um, the issue that uh, we can use renewables. Of course, we have to use renewables. We have to insist that this is a very good thing to do, but we have to understand the limitations of these technologies. We do not have a storage, really. We do not have a storage in a massive way that, uh, that can make this alternation between day and, day and night, between the days where you don't have wind. See, this, these are graphs obtained from the national network of electricity in Spain in one particular day where we had a maximum in the consumption in Spain. And you can see that in the, in the upper part of the graph is the, the amount of electricity that we are spending real, spending in Spain in one particular day where we had a maximum. Something like, this was a few years ago, but I'm sure that yesterday was something very similar. And in the lower part, you can see, you remember that the, the production of uh, electricity in Spain right now due to wind is in the order of 20%, more or less. 20% of the electricity is coming from wind in Spain. But look, look that particular day. There was no wind. Is this unusual? No, it's not unusual because when you have an anticyclonic situation in our country, you, don't, you do not have uh, wind. Uh, and this happens in the winter, and this happens in the, in the summer, always. So this is something, what do you do then? Of course, it's very simple. You put your gas uh, power plants to work. Very good, but then what are you doing? You are producing CO2, and this is something that we have to avoid, and the goal that we have in Europe is to go from 2050 to have a total decarbonization of our uh, energy production. Uh, actually, of all, activities related to, to CO2, but in order to get to that point, mm, it's not very clear how to do it. Can we do it only with this technology? If you do not have storage, I can tell you, I am very old, so uh, I will not uh, see this 2050, but I'm sure that there will be a big, big problem. Because, you know, we have been talking about this issue for many, many years, and I, Tell you, uh, I, I would ask you to go and to do this very simple uh, issue. Go to see the projections. Projections, take the projection of about 20 years ago. Take the projections about 10 years ago. Take the projection, this is one coming from the last, uh, the, the IPCC uh, meeting that we had a few years ago. And you see in all of them the same. You see that the reality goes up, up, up. And the projection is that very suddenly, poof, is going to fall. All the, uh, the, the heating, the, all the CO2 produ production, and so on. That, that's always the projection is very good. But the reality, when you compare what happened 10 years ago, what happened 20 years ago, 
what were the production? We are always making a big mistake. So um, the point I'm telling you is we have a big problem in the world, in our planet. So we better look for very good solution. And of course, fusion is a very good uh, solution. This is, uh, I'm going to, this is my objective today to convince you that uh, certainly it is. And why is that? Well, see, because uh, nuclear fusion power plant, I mean, nuclear fusion has a big uh, characteristic, and it is that uh, with very small amount of uh, fuel, you can produce huge amounts of energy. In fact, with only 45 liters of water and one battery that you have in your portable computer, many of you have or I have here, with this combination, you can produce as much energy as 40 tons of coal without producing any CO2. Uh, so it means essentially with that 45 liters of water and with a little bit with a battery from your portable, you can produce enough energy to, uh, to produce 200,000 kilowatt hour, which means more or less the energy that any of us are going to, to spend during these 45 years. It's not only that uh, you spend with your mobile and so on, it's to take into account the food, the production of food that you are eating and blah, blah, all the industrial uh, issues related to the consumption of energy that you are somehow sharing when you buy something. Uh, this is, why is that? Well, you will see in just a moment why is this, uh, this uh, possibility. Essentially, what, as you see, the fuel that we need is water. We have plenty of water in the world, fortunately, and lithium, some, some lithium, which is not very, very much. I mean, with uh, one portable right now, more or less everybody, or um, the number of portables, especially the, the used ones, is uh, almost the same as the number of people that we have. So this would be very nice, but this is science or so is fiction. Mm? Uh, this is, as I said, well, we are talking about this, but it's really, it's really something like uh, a reality. Well, I can tell you fiction, fiction it is. No? If you look at many, many movies, uh, this is from the Spider-Man, remember Spider-Man, the guy was there with uh, something uh, obtaining big energy. You, typically, it's true that the, the bad guys are working with fusion. This is something to worry about. I didn't notice. And in the Wall Street, uh, there was a movie about Wall Street. It was about inertial confinement at that time where the, there was a big, big breakthrough, I think, in Livermore, and somehow that, that created a big uh, fight in, the, in, the, um, in Wall Street. You know, the passengers, this, this movie, where the energy for to move towards um, huge, uh, I mean, big amounts of uh, space uh, long was um, done with uh, fusion. Of course, they're very good. Uh, I like very much this uh, Back to the Future, where the, the guy finally, the McLaurian, was uh, using a, a, fusion, a fusion machine. And this is also very interesting. If you saw Star Trek, also, you saw that they are using uh, fusion, but this is, this is really something very interesting. Uh, I was right there only a few months after this was filmed, and this is not really, I mean, this is a picture it's from a Star Trek, but the place where this is done, see, we are so much, we look so much like fiction, that this is actually the real machine that is working in Livermore right now. And they saw when the, the, the guys who produced the movie, they saw this place, they said, well, you don't have to change anything, we'll go there. And they didn't change anything, they only put the, the, the actors there. And it's really an impressive how science and fiction somehow get, uh, get together. But no, really, I mean, that uh, fusion power is working, this we know. In fact, we have one one fusion power plant working. The only problem is that it's 150 million kilometers from here. But it's giving us enough energy to allow that we, we exist and we, we can uh, do our daily life. Now, can we do that in, in, in our planet? It's not so easy. This is true, and this is the reason why 
we have been for so many years without obtaining the, I mean, since the first uh, fusion experiment uh, you could say will be in the 50s when you have uh, the explosion of the fusion um, thermonuclear bombs. You can see that um, we are working on, on this issue and how we can do it in, in our, in, I mean, in our planet. In, in, in the sun, what you are op doing is um, what nature is doing due to the huge pressure that you have in, this, uh, in the sun due to the huge mass. Mm, they are producing the fusion of um, hydrogen, protons, really. Uh, what happened there is this is a very slow reaction, which is very good for us because it has lasted five billion years and is going to last another five billion years. But to do it efficiently in our, in our planet is not so simple. If we look at the fusion of um, other, other simple, relatively simple reactions. And the one that uh, we are using to, to, in order to do it, uh, the most efficient one is the one that diffuses the two isotopes of the hydrogen, deuterium and tritium. If you fuse them, as you see, you get uh, some helium, um, nucleus of uh, helium, and then you get a neutron. The uh, amount of energy that you get is very, very huge. And this is why per reaction, the amount of energy that you get uh, in, the, in a fusion reaction is, is so high. It's not so simple because this tritium, um, the deuterium I mentioned, it is in the, in the water, and you have plenty of um, deuterium in, the, in, in water. It's one every 6,500 uh, molecules of water contain deuterium. So you have plenty of deuterium to last for billions and billions of years. Tritium does not exist. Tri tritium is, um, is radioactive, it's a radioactive material which has a, a, a average uh, half-life of uh, a little bit more than 12 years, 12.3, and it doesn't exist in a big amount of uh, quantities in in, <coughs> in our planet. So you have to produce this tritium in order to have a, an efficient way to, to in a future power plant. So the order to do, in order to do it, we take advantage of this neutron that is uh, happening right there. We put the lithium that I mentioned before. We heat the lithium with the neutron that is going to happen inside the power plant, and then you get tritium. So you put the tritium inside, and you then somehow you get the, the uh, the circular, the circular economy and the treatment that you produce, you burn and so on. And how do you do that? Well, you will hear in this course essentially with two big uh, ways to do it, which is the magnetic confinement of fusion or the inertial confinement of fusion. I'm going to talk more, which is my, the, the, what I did dedicated in um, my, my professional life to the magnetic confinement. The magnetic confinement, lo que tries is to, to confine these reactions that need to be developed at very, very high temperatures that you will see right now, to isolate them with a magnetic bottle. Um, and this magnetic bottle, we know how to do it right now with uh, several approaches, but the two main approaches are what we call tokamak and stellarator, which are not that big difference. Stellarator is something that we have in the middle of Madrid, in CMAT. We have a, a machine working on these principles since uh, the 90s, late uh, 90s. And you can, I can invite you to, to come and to see if you have the opportunity and, and visit this, this, uh, this machine. Um, but the, the big, the big um, effort in the community, in the fusion community, is given by the tokamak and the, the, big magnetic the biggest magnetic bottle that we have working right now is what is called JET, the Joint European Torus, which is in England, but it's a, a European uh, machine. You can see how big it is. We can play here as um, look for Wally. You, you remember, look for Wally here. You see it's not so easy, so easy to, to find it. You see Wally is, Wally is there. It's in red and, and, and it's there. I mean, it's a huge uh, experiment. You can see somebody inside the, the machine, uh, inside a vacuum vessel. This is what we call 
we call it vacuum vessel because what you have inside is really is really vacuum. You will show I will show you in the moment the characteristics. And in that machine, which is the as I said the biggest uh, in the world right now working, it was obtained already a fusion power coming from the fusion reactions. The, these fusion reactions uh, obtain in the order of 16 megawatts, in a, as you see in a peak, uh, in a moment um, for a, only a few, a few seconds. And you can see on the right how it looks like when this machine is working. You see it's really empty. You don't see anything because when something is very, very hot and the, the center of this uh, fuel this combination of deuterium and tritium is very, very hot at this point. It's in the order of 100,000, uh, 100 million um, Kelvin. A, a, the the um, light is not emitted at that particular, at the, at the wavelength that you can see. So you see it's really, it's really dark or it's really transparent because it's not emitting at this high energy. Uh, the problem is that uh, in order to obtain those uh, 16 megawatts, you have to put into the plasma, into the, your fuel, in the order of 23 megawatts. And in order to get these 23 megawatts that you were putting as a heating system to your machine, you have, of course, to produce, to, to come from the energy grid with a much more uh, um, big amount of uh, of uh, energy, so it was not a very efficient uh, way to do it, but it was not the, the objective. The objective was to prove that it's scientifically possible, that it's no longer a fiction, really it's not a fiction, it's science, we know how to do it. We don't know it's still how to do it in, in a very efficient way, we still do not have a net production of energy, but we know that this is perfectly possible to do it and the same thing or something similar you can see also and you will hear from, um, in a, from inertial confinement. But the characteristics, you know, the problem is that in order to get a, a, a plasma uh, working at this uh, level of performance is very, very demanding. You see the temperature of your fuel, you are talking about something of the order of 100 million um, Kelvin, as, a, as I mentioned, which is about 10 times the temperature in the middle of the, in the center of the sun. You need a density in, our, in the case of magnetic confinement, which is in the order of um, 1 million less than the atmos atmospheric density. This is why we call it a vacuum vessel, and we have a vacuum what we have inside. And you need to have to be able to confine your energy confinement, I mean your energy, what we call the energy confinement time, for a few seconds. It is not so simple to confine, you, you know, you have something about 100 million degrees, it's very hot, so what does, when something is very hot they want to expand. And you remember that you are trying to confine with a magnetic uh, battle. So when you combine these three parameters, which are the key parameters, for fusion, also magnetic and confinement, you, you can see what is the power amplification, what is the fusion power that you are putting, uh, that you are obtaining, sorry, with the input power that you are putting. And this is a combination that tells you the n tau t, n t tau, which is what is the density that you are able to confine, at what temperature, for how long. And this, when you get something which is greater than one, Right now, our devices that are working, the, this Q is less than one. In ITER, that we'll talk about uh, in a moment, the, the, the plasma is able, should be able to obtain a factor of 10. For a control ignition in, in magnetic, you need on the order of 30. So we are good working on precisely on this. Now, but we are working, uh, as I said, we have been working on this since the 50s, I would say, in late 50s, in the 60s. And, and you know, we talk about the change in the government here now, uh, I mean, in, in, in Spain, but uh, of course, you this is public money, so you need to have uh, very good uh, support from, from the public. And in fact, for I see many young people here, for many of you, if not all, uh, when you talk about Reagan and Gorbachev, you say this is history. Well, for us it's not a history. I mean, for fusion people it's not so much history because in the very first meeting that 
people say is when the, the Cold War uh, really ended. They said, I was in the United States uh, at that time, so I got, actually I have this New York Times, I have it at home still, I kept it. And when you see what uh, they say here, the text of the joint, they say, of the US-Soviet statement, they say, greater understanding achieved. I, I ask you to go to the, to the uh, library, look for this uh, and read what uh, they say there. They didn't agree on anything, except of one thing. You see, they say, okay, let's do fusion. Because, you know, this is one of the things. Fusion research, in particular in magnetic, uh, had nothing to do with uh, anything related to, to anything classified. So it was very simple to, to agree on, on, the, on doing this fusion research. But look at the date. Look at the date. They say, OK, let's, do, let's build something but together uh, to, to prove that fusion is a reality. Look at the date. It's November 22, 1985. OK, next. See, this is the signature of the actual agreement to say, OK, let's, let's do it. See the date, 21 November is actually exactly the same day, but only that is 2006, 35 um, late years later, right? 25 uh, days, uh, years later. It's, it's really, it's really took a long time. Actually, you can recognize um, some of the, well, I have a little bit more hair, but you can recognize this part in there. And this is when ITER, the, big, the biggest uh, experiment that is uh, under construction right now for magnetic confinement, uh, started. As you can see, JET was huge. ITER is even, even higher, I mean, uh, greater size, uh, going from 10 times the volume of the plasma, this is in principle is supposed to, to prove that the plasma inside is able to produce more energy than you need to put into the plasma, which doesn't mean that uh, you will get any electricity because you, you will not get. And this is a, the, a, an experiment which is, I mean, sometimes we say pharaonic because it's really, it's really huge. You see the, the, the size, the, the weight of this machine the order 23,000 tons, which is more or less like the, this is being built in, in France, in the south of France, in a multilateral agreement between the United States, uh, Japan, Europe, Russia, India, um, China, uh, and South Korea. I don't think I left uh, any of the, of the partners. But of course, we is in France, so we, we were using the French, um, symbols in order to, to, to have this. Uh, the vacuum vessel, the weight is even bigger than the, greater than the Eiffel Tower uh, mass. Uh, you see it's very much advanced. Uh, you have the construction here of one of the modules of the vacuum vessel that you have it right now in, in, in ITER. is right now under the installation of uh, these uh, big issues, I mean big components which are, um, all of them, as I said, are um, really, the numbers are unbelievable. The mass of only one of these coils that are going to produce the magnetic battle is like 10 of uh, this uh, caterpillar bulldozer. Uh, here you can see the guys in the middle of one of the coils that are going to produce the, the poloidal field. Uh, this already built uh, by Europe, the cryostat, because all the coils are going to be superconductors, so they have to be at very low temperatures, close to the absolute zero, about three Kelvin. And you see it's, it's as big as the, as the Jefferson Memorial. Here you have the actual construction of the cryostat uh, top it was done. You see the, the way that the construction is, uh, is going on, Right now, these are some pictures. The transportation of the, of the components is a big issue. They go to the south of, um, uh, to the Marseille port to go to the, where the place is, is, being, construction, is being constructed. Here you have the, the ITER site, as you see, very, very well advanced. And in principle, in 2025, we should have the, 
this machine working, I would say maybe uh, 2027 or so on. But even this will be only one step. You see, this is this is a, a big effort to, to really build uh, this uh, this machine is really a big effort. And as you see, it's not mm, we went from these uh, scientific, you could say, machines like the one we have in Siemat, uh, going to the construction of ITER to produce this one 500 megawatts thermal megawatts uh, because th there is no is one single kilowatt hour that uh, will be produced. From there, there will be a need for a construction of demo, which is a demonstration where actually there will be a production of electricity working for one to two hours. But even that by itself is not enough. You will hear about a, a one project that is going to be presented, which is called Dones that it will give you the materials, I mean, the validation of the materials that are needed in order to construct uh, this, this demo and the machine. And actually, we are proposing and we hope that it will be built a big experiment in, in Granada. CMAT is participating in, in all of this uh, effort. In fact, and this is something that I wanted to mention, um, see, you say, well, investment on, in science, so what? I mean, uh, this guy is like a uh, big... Uh, well, it's not only that we like to, to have big toys. I mean, working on, this, on these uh, projects, you generate a lot of uh, technology, you generate a lot of uh, um, places to work. And as an example, this machine, I mean, the, the, the effort that was done in CMAT in in the late 90s with the construction of this TJ2 uh, that was financed in a 45% by the European Union, 60% by the Spanish companies. And we had now the fusion, the energy, the uh, fusion for energy, which is the agency that is constructing uh, the European responsibility, has the European responsibility for the construction of ITER, uh, which is in Barcelona with a budget of about 7 billion uh, euros. Spain is really the third country. The companies working in Spain are getting the amount of contracts is the third, the order of the third in, in Europe. In front of Germany, United Kingdom, and on, on any, any other country. It means that more than one billion already went back to the Spanish companies, generated, as I said, technology, generated places to, to work. But uh, this is not only the, the, the way that, uh, I mean, we are talking about ITER, but uh, there is um, a lot of new experiments. This is a good opportunity for the young people to work because there are a lot of new experiments going on in, in Germany, in Korea, in, in China, which are smaller, big, but smaller than, than ITER, but working, or in Russia, they started right now with the T, 15MD. And not only that, uh, you know, well, this is a big one in Japan that is also being, being under construction now. So there are a lot of opportunities. And very important, these are public, the ones that I mentioned. But now there is starting to come new private initiatives. I don't know how good they are. I mean, because, you know, they are private and, and sometimes it's difficult that they publish, they don't publish exac exactly everything of their achievements. But some of them uh, here that are going on in, this is an MIT um, generated uh, spin-off. Uh, you have one in similar in, in Europe, in the Tokamak Energy, and not only in magnetic, but also on inertial confinement, which they claim that in 10, 15 years, they will be producing electricity. Uh, will it be true? Okay. I, I wish that, uh, I hope so. Uh, but you see, there are many, many right now working on in Canada, United States, uh, Europe, and so on. And some, see, th this for example, this project that you can see in the web, um, this project that is by Lockheed uh, Company, you know, this is a huge, I mean, it's a big contractor in, in, the, in the US. They claim that in a few years they will have something like a 100 megawatt um, machine that will fit in a truck. Mm. 
Well, we have our doubts, of course, but this is private. We don't know exactly what they are doing. They say that they, they will get it. I hope so. I mean, it would be very good if they, they, they are able to do it. We have our doubts, but it will be very good. What I mean to say is that we are in a very good moment where uh, in order to convince cities are private initiatives, they have to convince people to put, uh, I mean, big amount of money. If we are talking projects which at least are 100 million euros or 100 million dollars. So in order to convince private investors that uh, to, to put their money, I want to think that uh, they, are, they have good arguments to, to convince people. So and this is a reality. OK, and now, but we are talking about challenges of uh, fusion, and I want to finish with one particular one. It's about, uh, you know, I mentioned at the very beginning in my CV, so to say, that there was the, uh, one of the deputy director generals of ITER. In fact, I was responsible for safety, for the nuclear safety there. And this is something that I want to insist to the community, to the fusion community, that they cannot forget this issue. Because if they forget this issue, we will have the same problems that the traditional nuclear energy uh, is having. And this is not something easy. So let me put it this way. We need, we need uh, uh, I mentioned, in order to get uh, fusion, you need tritium. Tritium is a radioactive, it's, it's kind of a, a hydrogen. It's a form of hydrogen. It's an isotope. So it means it's very volatile. I mean it, it's not so easy to confine, to, to put it together in one place. And you need, for something like it, you need four kilograms. In inertia confinement, you don't need that many. Well, if you think the pellet uh, factory, I think you will be in this order of magnitude. In, in France, just because you have these uh, four kilograms, and the radioactive waste that was produced will be produced in, in ITER, which not necessarily will be produced in a power plant. It means that the ITER in France was considered as a basic nuclear installation. And then it means that you have to go through a very detailed process to defend that you do not have a problem with safety. We will, uh, we, you have to confine, you have to take into account two issues. The confinement of the radioactive materials that are being produced, because you have used neutrons that are going to radio, I mean, activate um, materials, and the limitation of the people and environment to this radiation. It's very good that in ITER we, ha we were able to prove that you don't need to have as a safety function neither the fusion reaction, because they are intrinsically um, safe, you could say, the reaction, and the power dissipation. Is that, that means the cooling system. This is not so clear that you will have to do it, you can do it in a, in a, in a big machine. But you have to take into account all the traditional elements. I mean, are we going to have an earthquake? What happens is there's this hydrogen um, somehow can get in a, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a gas. So if it is a gas, it may explode. You know, you hear about the gas explosion all the time. I mean, you have to take into account all these issues. And finally, taking into account all these issues, we were able to prove to the nuclear regulator that the ITER was safe and we got the, the nuclear license. It's not, as I said, it's not an easy thing. And this is something that the, the best thing when you design something is that you do it from the very beginning, you take into account these issues. And in fact, we have identified, I, I take into account, I mean, um, I would like to highlight this, uh, this review article that we published in Nature a few years ago, where we identify these safety gaps for fusion demonstration reactors. They're, they're not uh, something that you cannot uh, avoid, but uh, I mean, it's something that you can avoid. But you have to take it into account when you design, when you, we are getting very close to the idea of building a power plant. So you have to take into account what, is the, what are the issues? This hydrogen dust explosion, you, you, you know, when you have very small, I mean, big amount, but of very small particles that's the, of dust, they, they may explode if you have a, an, an energy system that gives you some, some energy. And things like that, the electromagnetic loads, what are they due to the plasma disruption? Many of these are very 
critical for the magnetic confinement. What I mean is that esta reunión está siendo grabada. I'm beginning to see somebody else besides me. That's okay. <laughs> so, good thing that it was not uh, taped uh, with all the comments I made about the government. So, uh, so just with this, ja I, I finish almost. Um, let me give you my, my personal views. There is not a simple and probably is not a unique solution to the energy problem that we have right now in the world. And we have to intensify, we have to, to dedicate a lot of, I mean, public money for research in, in energy. And you, you know, being the director general of CMAT, uh, you, you know that um, this is a very personal thing. That, but I'm convinced that this is, this is, this is a, a must. Uh, the scientific feasibility of fusion has been proven and now we have to construct ITER and to prove that technologically this is also uh, possible. And you know, uh, this uh, is true, I, I hope that I convince you that the research in nuclear fusion is having a very good momentum in public and private uh, initiatives. And we have um, uh, nuclear fusion right now is a reality and it has this potentiality to be cheap and inexhaustible source and environmentally friendly. Um, so let's solve all the challenges that we have, uh, including the nuclear ones, and then you should be, we should be able to, to solve this issue. And just to finish, you know, um, when I was, um, I was a kid and I like uh, very much this uh, Star Trek um, saga um, and I, there was one particular um, movie, one where Dr. Spock, um, they, they had a problem with the, with the Enterprise, I don't know what the problem was, but they, they needed a, a piece that was no longer fabricated. So they have to go back in time, and they, they used to go, they came, came back to the 80s, I think it was. And when they arrived to the, to the Earth in the 80s, Dr. Spock, Dr. Spock did something like that, the smells, the smells is very bad. You know, these poor guys, they are still in the nuclear fusion era. They haven't achieved the nuclear fusion era yet. So, I want to say that welcome to the new fusion era. Ah. And with that, I finish. So, so thank you very much, Carlos, for this beautiful talk. So maybe there is time for some questions. Is there any question that you would like to make to Carlos? Uh, you, you presented really nice pictures at the beginning of the evolution of the need of electricity. How do you think that the new era of electrical cars could even push up this, this need of electricity? The new, sorry, the the, the... the new era of elect electrical cars. Oh, well, I think it's a must. Uh, to, it must be increased, because the only way to decarbonize uh, the society is to rely more and more on electricity. But the problem is to have sources that really are able to produce in a good way, I mean, uh, in a nice way, uh, this electricity. Of course, it, it must be a combination. Right now, I don't see any, any other uh, solution than the combination of what we have. And this combination, certainly at the level of the world, in my opinion, must include also the nuclear fission. Because otherwise, I don't see how you can really achieve this uh, big goal that you have for the world to be decarbonized in 2050. I, I simply don't see. Because, and you need to do, in order to get to that point, in my view, you must have uh, a big uh, effort in the uh, storage, uh, working on, on, on doing the research on storage, because otherwise, in my view, I think we are going to have a big, big problem.
Any other question? Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I so apologize. So if not, that uh, I let's thank uh, Carlos for the nice talk.